So I'm Joshua Young, and I'm the program manager for the East Asia program. And um, we're very happy to have so many people here and to talk about EAP student funding. Um, I'm going to turn it over to the East Asia program director, Andre, Professor Andrea Bachner, and she is going to um, introduce herself and introduce the other people who are on this panel. Andrea? Hello, hi. Uh, hi, I'm Andrea Bachner. I'm the director of the East Asia program and also faculty in comparative literature. Welcome today to this info session about all the funding opportunities that uh, the East Asia program offers. Um, so um, let me first introduce the panelists and the people work, who have been working and are working on making this event happen. Um, and I'll also go really quickly through what we're going to discuss today and what the order of um, our program is going to be. Um, so um, we're talking, do, do we have the slide of the funding opportunities actually? Okay. Um, so let me introduce the panelists first. First and foremost, um, we, um, we have some of the uh, some graduate students who work in East Asian studies and former awardees of some of the East Asia program uh, fellowships who are generously sharing some of their insights uh, and also help us with the uh, Q&A. So uh, these are um, uh, in order of appearance, Xiao Zhong, um, Kun Huang, uh, a PhD student in comparative literature and a former CV star recipient, Xiao Zhong Sun of city and regional planning and a former CV star recipient. And uh, later on, uh, another student will join us, Tina Grit Sirarat of the Asian Studies Department, who was an Archie Smith recipient. Uh, then we have a couple of um, faculty uh, panelists, and this is uh, Professor John Whitman, the Department of Linguistics, who's also a member of the East Asia Program Steering Committee. And uh, I will also act as one of the faculty participants and panelists. Um, and then I also want to briefly introduce the EAP team, which is um, Joshua Young, the EAP manager, whom you've already uh, seen. Then we have Jennifer Field, who, uh, um, who is the person who does a lot of work with these fellowships, right? She is uh, the EAP administrative assistant. And then we have Amala Lane, who is our initiatives coordinator, and she's responsible for the fantastic loop uh, that you've probably seen as we started uh, this session. Um, so, a couple of words about what we're going to cover today. We're going to talk about the semester long EAP fellowships. We're talking briefly about um, the language grants. Okay, you can see it on the slide. So the graduate fellowships, those are semester long fellowships. We're going to talk a little bit about the language study grants, which are short term intensive language study grants that's their name, um, and also about the travel grants, uh, which are support for research travel that is coordinated between East Asia Program and the Audi Center for International Studies. Um, our schedule for today will be, um, I'll hand it over after this right away to the student panelists. They're going to provide some insights from their experience. Um, then, We'll listen to a um, couple of faculty voices. Uh, and this is uh, John Whitman and myself to give some recommendations of what this process looks like from the, the side of faculty and faculty reviewers. And um, then we'll have an overall presentation about some of the logistics and how this all works in terms of application process. And this is uh, something that Joshua Young will guide us through. And then we'll have time for um, Q&A. And for the Q&A, please, you can use either the chat function. So feel free as you listen to all of us to put some of your questions in the chat. Um, we'll also open it up to uh, raise hands. Um, function um, and uh, we can call on you. Um, as Josh has pointed out at the beginning, we're also compiling a um, FAQ section 
We're going to share some of it with you. And we're also using some of the Q&A here to generate these uh, um, FAQ sections. All right. So uh, in the interest of time and to leave enough time for the panelists and especially for, for Q&A, I'd like us to move into the parts in which students actually share some of the insights and um, you know, um, give you a, a bit of, a, of an insight into the process and recommendations of um, of uh, how they went about their applications and their experiences. And we're going to start with Kun Huang, and then um, after her, Xiao Zhongsun um, will take over. Here you go. Okay, thank you, Andrea. So, um, hi, everyone. I'm a six year um, PhD student in comparative literature. And over the years, I've received, um, I've applied to and received a variety of BAP fellowships. Um, so basically including all of the major, um, like the semester long um, fellowship and also the language study grant and also the travel grant. And I'll talk a little bit of how I use them. So for, um, I um, applied to the language study grant for summer language school um, in Japanese um, and um, it was the program called Inter University Center, IUC, Inter University Center for Japanese Language Studies, based in Yokohama. It's a very prestigious um, program that is um, specifically like designed for academic needs. So it was very helpful. Um, I got into the summer school after two years of um, learning Japanese at Cornell, and um, the so that summer um, helped me to boost my Japanese to the advanced level and basically um, it fulfilled my research needs with um, Japanese language, which is not my main research language, but it was still helpful for doing uh, research, especially into the late Qing Republic, Republican period of uh, modern China. And then um, I also got the EAP travel grant and I used it in combination with a few other travel grants, which includes the um, Henry Luce ACLS Pre-Dissertation Research Fellowship and the um, Cornell Grad School um, travel grants and the uh, now the Center's International Research Travel Grants. So um, this all these grants together allowed me to do one semester of um, archival research um, in China after my A exam, and it helped me to put together a lot of my primary sources um, for dissertation writing. And then I also got um, the semester long graduate fellowship and I used it to cover one semester um, of my fifth year. And, and I used it um, at Cornell to write my dissertation and it allowed me to write, write up um, like one of my dissertation chapter and also to uh, turn it into a journal article, which is currently under review. And um, I guess it could it could have been more productive if it weren't during COVID, because during COVID it's hard to travel to any archive and it's hard to like really go into the library to um, like see different um, uh, like what is what is there. Um, but I guess that's how life is. Like when I fly, I didn't know <laughs> um, this is what's going to happen. And my experience applying to this fellowship, I would say have been pretty smooth. So it definitely helped that two of my committee members are quite familiar with the East Asia program and the application process. So uh, Andrea um, has um, told me to apply uh, since like very early since, um, in, the pro uh, in my graduate program. And um, also I, um, I have been an officer in the East Asia programs graduate student steering committee and um, in the committee, um, basically it allows me to connect with a lot of the upper year students who have applied and got these various fellowships and who, um, I guess like um, who we could contact to ask for their advice and um, some would also very generously share their material. So um, in terms of access to information and communication it's been quite smooth for me. And um, some challenges. So I would say one thing that's that's a bit like confusing for me is when I apply for the um, research travel grants. So there's the Anaudi Center's International Research Travel Grant, and then there's the EAP supplement to it. At least when I was applying, and it seems the Anaudi grant is the prerequisite for the EAP grant, but then they're not the same thing. So 
it, it just took me a, a, a little while to figure out oh how that works and like oh I'm actually submitting to proposals um so that's I guess the main side of thing that is not um very apparent to students but um I think I think the advice is to read carefully what is like um, written on the fellowship um, information page. And usually it's all, it's, everything is there, just had to read everything carefully and also direct questions to the right people. And in terms of is um, how it works with my department, um, I think the only glitch was that when I was using the semester long fellowship, um, there was this, um, expectation of the department to top up the in the tuition um, but then I think they forgot to do that <laughs> at the beginning of the semester and then for a while I was like owing Cornell some money but then that got sorted out after I figured out oh okay um, they forget that they need to do that for me because I got this fellowship so the lesson I learned is to really to keep close track of everything and get ready to communicate um, as early as possible if you figure out something is not it's not working because if you're not um, I guess if you're working with like different departments and different um, entities um, like you should be the person to initiate um, like all kinds of like problem solving um, skills so um, but in general the process has been very um, smooth and um, EAP stuff have been like like very very helpful and also the award timing um, works pretty well with our department and usually it's like um i was like i was notified well um ahead of time to um, plan out um, what i need to do um the next year and i think i'll stop here and um i'll stay for the q a if anyone um, has any questions Thanks so much. Um, these are great insights, and uh, we can follow up on some of the the, the issues raised in the Q and A. And I think in Josh's presentation, some of it will also come up about some of the logistics of application process. I am handing it over to Xiao Zhong. Okay. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Xiao Zhong uh, Sun from uh, uh, Regional Science uh, Department of City and Regional Planning. Uh, so. Today, uh, my sharing will be based on like a basic uh, framework, uh, like three major questions uh, so that you can have a rough idea uh, what uh, this fellowship is and then how the uh, application process will be look like. But it's uh, very specifically related really, really to my field. And so uh, if you have any further questions, you can raise it up in the Q&A section. So the first one is, uh, uh, what what did you do is my uh, like my EAP fellowship that will be pretty similar because when I apply the uh, fellowship is also right before the pandemic hit so when I was a granted it was the uh, uh, during the pandemic so everything uh, some some of my proposed uh, my uh, proposed ideas are cannot be fulfilled so. So my research is actually about regional inequality in China. So my original proposal is that I am going to do a few study uh, for one semester to uh, go to several uh, regions that are with a relatively high level of uh, inequality in terms of, of uh, economic development. But with all the travel restriction and all the stuff, it didn't work out. So, uh, so I basically spend the, the, the time just at Cornell doing research and use the fellowship actually helped me to uh, to uh, to get some exercise uh, ex uh, to get some uh, digital database exercise. So that's uh, that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is how did it help my research? I think that uh, uh, I think the fir first thing is that, that the fellowship definitely off offer a great help uh, financially. Uh, because uh, my field of study doesn't provide any fellowship after I believe it's the first first year or yeah. So the fellowship is a great opportunity for me to do just the research without doing any assistantship that, that you can use this time just to develop your thesis, your writings and all the stuff. Um, and also moreover, when I apply to the 
to the access to some database, actually the, the fellowship title definitely offer me some convenience and legitimacy. I mean, it's much easier if you have, uh, you want to access some uh, restricted data and you have a grant name, it will be much easier for you to, you know, like get the access of the data. So, so what made me uh, apply for EAPS fellowship? And uh, I think is that uh, our field of study actually has a long legacy of applying for EAP fellowship. Uh, so most of my senior cohorts uh, who study uh, as long as at they are focusing on the East Asia regions apply for this fellowship. So, so I learned about this fellowship the, since the first year I came uh, as a PhD student. So that's pretty early. So I know that there is option out there uh, pretty early on. So that uh, everything I just plan, you know, like, uh, to match with my founding timeline and all the stuff, my uh, working process. And so, so I know that, uh, so I, I apply for this uh, fellowship right after my, uh, I, I pass my A exam. So, because that's how I schedule my, uh, my research. Uh, so yeah, it definitely helps a lot. If you have a cohorts, uh, like a, a list of cohorts that, that they have been applying for this and they, they are the recipient of this fellowship and they, they just offer a lot of like uh, great insights and you know they share their application process and their, their also their grant proposal that, that definitely helps like uh, what, what, you, what you should address when you apply for this grant. So yeah, I think that's, that's uh, what I want to share on my part. And if anybody has questions, then you can raise, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. We're moving on to the faculty panelists, uh, starting with Professor John Whitman, Department of Linguistics. Thank you much, very much, Andrea. And it's wonderful to see uh, so many attendees here uh, learning about these fellowships. So I've been at, at Cornell for a long time, and I believe I was the faculty chair of the um, Fellowship Committee uh, as early as 1990. Um, so that's quite a long time ago. Um, so the process has evolved over the years. Um, we have more fellowships now than we did in the 1990s. Um, on the other hand, uh, in some fellowship categories, the endowment funds have shrunk. So there have been periods in the past 30 years when we have been able to give out more fellowships. Still, we have a lot. I think we are among perhaps the most generous area studies program, which is fitting since um, East Asian studies is, is uh, uh, so important at Cornell. So I'll give a few pointers from the faculty standpoint about uh, what might be useful for you applying as graduate students. Um, first, uh, know that because our combined fields are so, so diverse, You've heard from our two speakers so far, we have students in city and regional planning, comparative literature, other uh, departments in the arts college, departments in CALS, uh, departments in the ILR school, uh, departments in human ecology. We, we truly range across virtually every field um, in the university, including sometimes STEM fields. Um, that means that it's difficult for any one faculty committee to make a selection on the basis of academic merit. Because of that, uh, the committee and I am not on the committee currently. You should all be grateful to the faculty members who are. Um, we look primarily for objective criteria, and I'll mention a few. I think this is in the application materials. First of all, make sure that you don't have any incompletes on your record. Um, if you happen to have an incomplete and you know you're going to be applying for the, one of these fellowships, take care of it, get it removed from your record. Um, because that's something that faculty can point to right away. And because it's a criterion that's mentioned, if you have a, an incomplete, you probably won't get a fellowship. It's very important. Um, secondly, in terms of uh, your statement and also what the, um, your recommenders should know, um, it's best to avoid technical details that a generalist on the selection committee won't be able to appreciate. Having said that, if you have a legitimate project and your um, your faculty advisors or recommenders uh, recommend, notice, note, uh, observe, acknowledge that you're making 
good progress towards your dissertation, that's really all you have to worry about. Um, there's not a need to go over the top. Um, it is the case that, um, and Andrea uh, and or Josh, correct me if I'm wrong, because we don't have enough fellowships to go around for um, worthy applicants. We use, uh, to some extent, a seniority uh, 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 criteria. So the, the, the fellowships under our current um, financial constraints are not assigned to first and normally second year students. It tends to be students third year and above. I believe that's still correct. That doesn't mean you can't apply. You can apply at any level, um, but priority will be given to students. And, and I believe that um, Xiao Zhong and um, 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 Kun both uh, mentioned that they got their fellowships in their third year. Is that correct? Of uh, your program? I'm in my, I'm in my fourth year. Up your fourth year. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, but that is generally the way it goes now. And so post A is a standard um, kind of uh, place in your program to expect one of these fellowships and also where it can be effective. Um, I don't have too much more to say from the, the, the faculty standpoint, I think. I'll be happy to answer questions and I'll stick around to see if any specific questions come up. Andrea, does that cover major bases? Are there other things I should mention? I th um, think that's that's great, John. Thank you so much. And we, I think we can always, right, we decided to keep these like insights fairly brief so we can have more time for Q&A and really, you know, attend to some of your specific questions. Thanks. Great. All right. So I'll also offer a couple of insights and, and Sean has already summed up uh, some of these, uh, the important things like re fairly nicely. Um, so we're looking at a um, basic we're looking at what everybody's looking at when they're evaluating a project, right? So we're looking at, is this a good project and can you communicate it well? Is there support for your project? And this means at this stage, your recommenders. And is what you propose in terms of concrete research and concrete use of the, the fellowship opportunities that you want to make, is, is it actually timely and is this like well-conceived? This is these are really the criteria, right? And um, so as John has pointed out, it makes a lot of sense um, to be in touch with your recommenders early on, right? Um, this makes sense for anything anyway, right? For your whole career, right? So um, don't just like hand in your application and then, uh, you know, five minutes later say, you know, to your recommenders, oh, by the way, please write me a rec letter, right? You should be in conversations with your recommenders early on. And and also important, right, for this project, for this application, uh, and for other opportunities to try to keep the description of your project um, so that, say, a generally informed intellectual academic audience can read it, right, and, and can understand it. This doesn't mean that you can't go into, into any specifics, right? It doesn't have to be like an overall general description, but... Um, it would be really good for you to basically um, communicate what is important about this project beyond the very, very specific, say, field uh, or discipline criteria, right? Um, a couple of um, insights about actually how the selection process works. We have a selection committee that's made up of um, East Asia program faculty members. We usually do have a committee of three members, and we try to keep it fairly um, a fairly uh, kind of representative. Of course, since um, we really draw on students, faculty from across Cornell, from very, very different disciplines, there can't be a faculty member representative of your field specifically. But what we try to do is a fair kind of distribution of folks in the China field and in the Japan slash Korea field. Uh, and we're also trying for some distribution in terms of disciplines. So they will, the committee will not only be uh, constituted, say, by somebody uh, who's like more uh, in the humanity side of things. We always try to have a representation of different dis disciplines. Um, and, um, and yes, so uh, criteria, excellence, uh, preparation, communication, uh, fit in terms of timeline. Um, and we can go into 
more specifics in the Q&A, but I want to point to two things that we haven't mentioned so far, right? We have really mentioned the kind of interdisciplinary reach. And so we also encourage people who work at the intersections of different disciplines uh, to apply. This is work that we find extremely insightful. Um, but I also wanted to comment on the question of regional fit. So uh, this is the East Asia program, right? This has a whole history of area studies, uh, and this is the institutional framework for it. Um, so the fellowships we do have are in East Asia studies related field. But that said, we're really very interested in people working uh, basically across different regions. Um, so if part of your work is in an East Asian studies related field and part of that work isn't, then still apply, right? Um, we're really thinking about these categories fairly capaciously. Um, and uh, East Asian studies related research for us is not only study studies or work that takes place say, in uh, East Asian places where we can also think about uh, diasporic cultures, for example, right? And we're also thinking relatively capaciously about the, the spaces or sites of research if you're applying for uh, one of the grants for a research intensive project. Um, it does not necessarily have to take place in an East Asian country in order to be applicable to East Asian studies. Um, I want to finish my quick comments with a shout out for a new category we have within the fellowships, which is the Diverse Knowledge East Asia category, which is a category that we have designed um, with the aim of including more diverse work and more diverse voices within East Asian studies. So these are semester long grants uh, like the others, either for field research or for writing. Uh, and they target specifically candidates who present uh, and represent diverse voices and also projects who foster diversity, um, justice, um, equality. And you can see the descriptions of these categories uh, on the website. As I said, this is a fairly new category. So I just wanted to underline it and, and say that this is there. Um, all right. So this brings us to the next point, which is a short presentation, uh, which Josh is going to provide about some of the logistics um, some of the infrastructure, some of the, the specifics of for these fellowships. So this is, um, uh, Kun very helpfully broke down in her own experience, uh, these three types of, of funding. Um, so the graduate fellowships, which we call the big awards, these are the semester long graduate fellowships. Um, and uh, Xiaojong ha has had a CV star fellowship. Uh, Kun was also a CV star, I believe. Um, in any case, um, these are the, the fellowships. And then there's the language study grants, which Kun explained um, are for intensive language study, um, generally used over the summer. And then there's the travel grants, which are the East Asia program travel grants um, work hand in glove with the um, with the Ainaudi Center International Research Travel Grants. Um, and the reason for that is very simple, which is that the Ainaudi Center travel grants only cover international airfare. So that's it. Um, and East Asia program covers other expenses um, in country travel and housing and um, our you know research expenses such as well there's all sorts of things so um, okay let me let me get to my next slide the fellowships, there is a single application for these fellowships and it, it is at the, um, at this one online applications 
system funding app, inaudi.cornell.edu. Um, it will be opening soon. I would encourage you, if, if you're just considering to go online to here and look over what is there. So look at them early. You can start applications in all of these um, at any time and return to them. And so you don't have to worry about um, having all your materials before you get to the application. Um, the fellowships consists of these five named fellowships, um, but there is a single application. So you would put in one application, you will check off as many of these as you think are applicable to you. Um, and you should just check them all off and not worry about targeting one or the other. You can do that if needed in your narrative proposal. So um, there are no citizenship restrictions on, on East Asia program fellowships. You simply need to be a Cornell graduate student. Um, you must be a Cornell graduate student though, enrolled um, and incoming um, students are not eligible. So uh, don't, don't tell anybody that you know coming into Cornell for their first year to apply that, that they are just not eligible. Um, the East Asia Program Fellowships are structured on the Cornell Graduate School um, fellowship structure. So they are, the support is um, tuition, stipend, and health insurance coverage. So um, there is a single application form, as I said, and there are two letters of recommendation are required. Um, and those happen through the online application system, um, but you should be talking with your recommenders early very early and tell them that you are applying. Um, the system does send a, um, an email to your recommenders once you input their, um, their email addresses into an ap application. Um, and that will give them a link to upload their recommendations within the system. But, um, but you should be talking with them early, as everybody has said. The proposal narratives for the fellowship um, is a document upload. So um, you write a three to five page project proposal. Uh, as everybody, as both John and Andrea have said, um, this is a informed generalist reviewer committee so you should aim your language at people who are faculty but are probably not specialists in your discipline very important explain what it is that you are proposing to do with the fellowship so the specifics of your research are one thing but what you should be talking about is the, um, the actual practices of the research. Do you need to have access to certain databases and for what reason? Not what those specific um, database structures might be or the data structures of them, right? Um, and also you should, be saying what the product of your research work is likely to be. So Kun mentioned that she um, wrote a chapter of her dissertation and also that that is being, has, she has worked to turn that into an, a submitted article. 
um, that's a perfect example of product of research. So, um, and also explain how this research work would fit into your graduate career. Um, not all fields have the exact same uh, sequence of um, even of the milestone exam. So there's the exam, but um, dissertations are configured somewhat different in different um, in different fields. So uh, explain this again to a generalist but informed audience. If if you can, don't assume that they already know this. Um, okay, that's on to the language study grants. There are a small number of language study grants. It's, this is not a big program like the fellowships. Um, so these are um, these are for people who can demonstrate that they really do need to do this intensive language study at this point, right? Um, the timeliness is very important. Um, and these, because there's a small number of them, because they're also the one category of funding that's open to undergraduates, um, they tend to be more competitive. So while the fellowships are looking at something like a somewhere around 50% of people, well, it's it varies year to year, but 30 to 50% uh, um, award rate. Um, with the language study grants, it's probably down around 20% of applicants receive it. So um, I guess the point is that you you need to demonstrate that you really do need to do this language, intensive language study now. So, um, okay, the travel grants. Once again, um, these are research travel for short-term um, research travel. We use the same application as the INAUDI International Research Travel Grant. And then we ask you to submit ad additional materials um, which are basically a research plan and expenses of um, budget that addresses the, um, the non-international airfare part of it. We have a bunch of FAQs and we're gonna make these available on the website. Um, these are some of the standard ones that are already here. I'm not gonna go through them case by case because I think we should um, just have a question and answer with you all. But um, we do have these here and I can refer back to them. I, um, and again, we'll make these available to you all. Uh, okay, I think I'm going to stop here and if I can find my screen sharing and we will go on to an open floor question and answer. So yeah, th thank you so much, Josh. So it's uh, Q and A time. You can either use the chat and post your uh, question in the chat, or you can just use the raise hand function and we're going to uh, call on you. And uh, we're going to, um, since we have like different panelists and different perspectives, we're just like fielding questions as they come. Um, one thing is that, um... I wanted to take the chance to um, introduce the third um, of our student panelists, former awardees panelists, who is uh, Tinakrit Sirat, who has joined us. Um, I think Tinakrit, unless you really would like to share your experience, I think we'll just go on to the question and answer and people can ask you directly if that's okay um is that good tenacrit yeah that sounds good to me okay thank you okay so the floor is open 
uh, please use the raised hand function, okay, or put it in chat. I see one uh, question from Ling Tan Chen. Uh, hi, uh, I have a very quick question regarding the timeline of the fellowship. So for the fellowship application, the, de uh, the deadline is January. So uh, will the fellowship, uh, if uh, accepted, be awarded in the spring semester or the following fall semester or the spring after? Or great. it is randomly? Yeah. Yes, very great question. And that's something that uh, I apologize that I skipped over. So to go way back, we should make it clear that for East Asia Program Fellowships are applied for in the spring and they are used, they are awarded and used in the following academic year. So basically we, we give out the awards generally in March. We say that they have them and then they are used in either the fall semester or the spring semester of the following year. And um, the semester use is left up to the student and their department as to which works better for them. So. Thank you. Yep. Uh, John. Hi. Just want to follow up on that question. So if it's possible for us to use it during the summer, like um, if the award is rewarded in March, uh, can I use it during say May, between May and September um, for the summer semester? Uh, the answer to that is for the graduate fellowships, no. And that's because Cornell Graduate School um, will not, Summer, um, summer tuition and stipends are different from the semester ones. And so um, you cannot use a semester fellowship um, funding in the summer. Um, and, and let's see, but for um, the language study grants and for the travel grants, they can be used in both cases. You're eligible to use them for the following year after award. So basically from May, let's say May of, of one year through May of the following year at, at any time. You just need to keep us posted on when and how you want to use it. Yeah. Thank you. We have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, so I'll, I'll start with the ones that are uh, pretty straightforward to answer, right? So I'm not going in order of posting, but we're getting to everyone. So continue to post. We'll, we'll like, you know, monitor and get to these questions. So um, I see one that's easy to answer, which is, can I apply for this fellowship as a second year graduate student? Yes, you can. Absolutely. Right. So once you are a graduate student at Cornell, so in your first year, you can apply. So for your second year, you can apply in your second year. Uh, there's no restriction there. As my colleague John Whitman has um, pointed out, however, um, it is rather typical that students get these, say, um, maybe in their third, fourth, fifth year or so. But really, this depends on the argument you're making for what you need the fellowship for, right? So uh, if there's a good case for you to have that fellowship early for early research, for example, then that makes a lot of sense and the committee will look at, at these criteria too. Um, a somewhat related question is, does the graduate fellowship prefer students who plan to do field work? So for the semester fellowships, um, we kind of have them like vaguely in two categories. One is uh, doing field work ab abroad um, or away from Cornell, I should be saying, and these are in absentia fellowships and um, semester fellowships that are in place at Cornell 
um, for mostly doing writing, uh, typically, right? It depends a little bit on the discipline. We're uh, not necessarily making a discrimination in terms of it should be all field work or it should be, or we prefer field work over writing. Again, it really depends on the argument you make for what you need at that for your project, for your field at that specific point of your career. That said, financially for the East Asia program, in absentia fellowships are easier to finance than the Ad Cornell Writing Fellowships. But typically, uh, there is a, a mix anyway. Um, let's see, we have a couple more. Mm. Um, so Let I me want... just add to the, the question of you know, the um, field work versus others. There is, there is a specific question in the application of which mode you prefer. Um, and you can say that you prefer to do a field work research or in residence work, or that you don't prefer either, that either one would be fine. So um, that's covered in the application. So this one, um question specifically for the language grants, uh, and this is maybe something that Josh can answer, and the question is as follows. If I am applying to two language programs which require their own admissions processes, in my proposal should I list both programs depending upon whether or not I'm accepted into either program? Yes, that's a, that's a perfect solution. Um, so we recognize that the uh, the admissions processes for language programs don't coincide in timing with the awards often. And so you should say which ones you are, you have or are applying to. And um, generally we work it out um, if there's some sort of changes, yeah. Um, moving on to uh, another question. Uh, which is on timing. Um, I plan to conduct field work in East Asia this winter, which is during application period. Can I apply for the travel grant? My understanding is that no, Josh, because the timing I, doesn't work out. No, here. it doesn't work out. Um, so the earliest that you could use a travel grant would be um, would be May of next year. And but then you could you could use that travel grant um, not in the summer but in the winter of the following year. So, um, but you couldn't you couldn't apply and get it for use this December January. No. And um, another question is, the EAP webpage writes, EAP travel grants are not intended to supplement fellowships. Does it mean the applicant will not be awarded EAP's fellowship and travel grants at the same time, even though they can apply to both of them? No, and um, you can apply for both and you, you may be awarded for both, but they have to be, basically separate projects. So if you're applying for a travel, uh, a research travel grant, you need to set up that project as separate from your semester fellowship project. So you may, you may have a summer research project um, that you apply for and win a travel grant and you do that and that may be your travel to location and then use a um, an EAP fieldwork fellowship for the following semester not not having traveled back to Cornell um, that's very possible but they just need to be separate discrete projects yeah all right, moving on. It's it's great. Keep the questions coming. We still have some some minutes. So uh, here's the question: Since there are five different fellowships, is there any detailed description of the figures of each fellowship, except for the titles? So there's one category that is different, which is the diverse knowledge East Asia. So please refer to the description of 
applicants and projects that are apt for that fellowship, right? As I uh, described earlier, it's really to open up the field to different voices. And so it really, we really, really privilege uh, diverse applicants and diverse projects in this one. For the others, um, the names, um, and I, I agree that it's a little bit complicated. The names, some of them are specific to a specific area of East Asia. And this simply has to do with the pots of money that are designated uh, for those fellowships, right? So it's more an administrative problem, really. So um, indicate the ones you can check, like all the boxes you think apply. So say, um, if you're not doing re research on China or in China, uh, the, the designated um, China-focused ones might not apply for you. But in if in doubt, you can either contact us to ask us via email, or you can just indicate um, what you think applies to your project. And, uh, and then in your project description, it should become clear um, what kind of area you're working on. Um, the exception is the Diverse Knowledge East Asia, where it's really about the fit with the category, right? Which, and you can, of course, right, um, just tick the diverse knowledge East Asia um, box with some of the other boxes, right? You don't have to just apply for the, the diverse knowledge East Asia box. Um, all right, uh, timeline question. Following up on the previous question regarding the timeline, if the graduate fellowship has to be used no later than the spring semester, in the following year, does it mean that the graduate fellowship can't be used along with other year-long fellowships, say any other outside Cornell year-long dissertation fellowship? That's correct. Uh, as far as we describe it, uh, these fellowships, the semester-long fellowships cannot be combined with other grants or outside grants. Let's see. For the language grant, I am an undergrad who would like to use their language skills in their career in and in future graduate studies, but it is not necessarily urgent. Should I still apply? Um, Josh, any thoughts? I'd say yes, do please. Yes, do, do apply. Um, and we do not restrict these only to um, graduate study preparation research languages that that's a common use but um, if you can make the case for the need then um, then you stand a good chance of, of getting an award so yeah um, next question does the fellowship always replace our TFTA funding by default can I receive the fellowship and TA to get extra money at the same time? Uh, that's not what we actually designed these fellowships to do. These fellowships are really designed for uh, providing time uh, for research and for your writing. So this is really research, time and energy. Um, we, we don't allow that these be combined with other TA um, duties. Okay. As for Next uh, question. As for the requirement that the final work needs to pass the doctoral test, does that mean that the graduate students applying for the price need to study for a doctorate degree and pass the A exam? So um, these are these are graduate students, with the exception of the language study grants, right, which are for both graduates and undergraduate students. Um, but these are um, are the semester long fellowships and the research fellowships are for graduate students enrolled in a PhD or in an MA program. And uh, typically uh, we expect, because of the, the focus of these grants, we expect students to take these fellowships typically once they have passed their A exams. There might be um, exceptions for specific fields where earlier research is required um, and then make that case in your application. Uh, okay. Since EAP does not run an independent travel research grant application process and the button apply just directs us to an Audi Center International. The question continues. Um, okay. Let's see. Oh, 
Uh, oh, here you, we go. Yeah. Um, does it mean that we would be considered by an Audi travel grant automatically by submitting one single application? Yes. Um, so you will be you will be considered for both the INAUDI research travel grant and its airfare fare component and the East Asia program uh, travel grant for other expenses. There, I should say that there have been cases in the past where for one reason or another, an applicant has not been awarded an INAUDI research travel grant. And the East Asia program has decided to award a, a travel grant. So, um, so they're 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 the same application, but they're not entirely the the same thing. There, so um, there are some different considerations. I would just say that if there's any doubt, apply, put in an application. Um, Right. Okay. Next question. Suppose I'm studying how East Asian students in the U.S. merge into U.S. society. Should this kind of project be counted as East Asia related studies? I would say um, there's a good case for for this this case to be made. So the so it really depends on how you make the case in your in your project. For for me, I think that would definitely fall within the scope of East Asian studies, right, of, um, of issues, topics related to East Asia. Um, okay, let's see. Do the recommenders have to both be faculty? Could I ask my employer? Um, I think here it depends a lot on what your kind of discipline or work is like. Um, since these grants are very much tied to research and to writing for dissertation or related projects, um, it might make sense to um, have faculty members as recommenders. But in depending on what your project is and what your discipline is like, it might make sense for this to be your employer. Say you're doing uh, some related research, but outside of, say, the Cornell advising structure. And another one, is the stipend amount adjusted for the cost of living of the location of field work? No, it's not. And there's a raised hand, uh, Jenny. Go ahead, please. Um, so sorry if I missed this, but do we know when exactly the applications will start? Um, you mean when they'll be available for, um, yes. for any of these? So. Uh, in with by November 15th, all of the applications will be available. Yep. Um, and maybe early. So sure. um, I got a lot of questions from um, fellow students about whether we have to ap apply for affiliation in case they go abroad for like in absentia semester. Right. And I'm just wondering if like we have a list of universities or institutions Right. That are that we have connection with, like with the AP, so right. that we can apply for that, like affiliation. Yeah, yeah. that's that's um that's a very good point, and um and we should add some things to that. So, as you know, it's not a criteria that you have affiliation in order to use the fellowship awards. On the other yeah. hand, um, building up affiliations for the support of students when they are in the field is, is a great idea. It's something that we in the East Asia program and in the Anaudi Center at large are um, have been working on and considering. So um, yeah. yeah, it's a little tricky because we don't want to restrict people. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so we, my point is that like, so because of the visa application, sometimes it it, it is more convenient to to get yeah. some affiliation to apply for visa. I'm just wondering like if there's like a resource for students who are wondering like how to do with their research right. abroad to get decent information. Yeah, but I yeah. get your point. Yeah. There, I, I, um, so there currently is not any official 
um, resource for that, but um, it is something it is something to be considered. Um, and um, you may know that there's this global hubs initiative. One of the positive points of that would be precisely that kind of affiliation um, support for people. Yeah. I think Tinakrit, uh, thanks, thanks for joining and thanks for, for sharing your ideas. Um, I think this is a really good point. Um, since we get so many different applicants from so many different disciplines, I think it would probably be really difficult to, to have a list like that. But um, one of the things we have been thinking about is kind of to do a survey uh, among EAP faculty to see like what kind of contacts they have and might be able to say use or extend uh, on behalf of of our students um, and I think this is a project I think we still have to kind of think maybe in intelligent ways about it so if you have like a recommendation of maybe how to go about that we'd be really happy to hear it it's it's something I, I think I mean we're getting that this is like important for students at all levels but we we don't have it yet currently and don't i think don't have a good sense of how to go about it really yeah thank you so much professor Buckner. all right we are basically out of time um these were fantastic questions fantastic insights from the panelists thanks for everybody for to, everybody for joining for making this happen. Um, please be in touch if you have any questions and please apply for this grants. Um, and we're really, you know, we're really looking forward to seeing your project and to hopefully um, help out and support some of your work. All right. Thank you so much. Have a good rest of the day. Bye. Thank you, Kun. And Xiaoyang, yeah. that, that was really great. Yeah. Kenna Creek, thank you for showing up and for sending yeah. those. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Yeah, it was really, you did. really nice. Bye. Great. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thanks yeah. for organizing this so nicely. Jennifer, Amala, Josh, thanks. Yeah. Cool. Kenna Creek. Uh, Josh, yeah. can I just like add one point?